Mormons are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. They've had great success in business, in politics, and they make some of the best videos on the internet. Shout out to Studio C. So why is it that other Christian denominations don't associate them with the Christian faith? Well, we're gonna unpack that right now on Overtime. Hey everyone, my name is Josh and welcome to Overtime, a series of videos where we look at some of the most popular comments in the comment section on our Time Out series and we do a deep dive to unpack the discussion a bit more and have some dialogue. So today we are discussing the persons of Jesus and Joseph Smith. The reason we're doing this is because of Mormonism's association with Christianity. If you ask a Mormon, they're going to tell you absolutely that they are Christians. However, when you ask a church leader who follows traditional Christian systems of belief, most will say that Mormon teaching is an apostate religion to Christianity. So what's the deal? How do we navigate the two faiths and which are the two belief systems is most worthy of our following. It's best to look at what the religions profess to believe. We do this because these are the best ways that we can kind of compare notes, as it were. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Mormon? Who was Joseph Smith? So with that, we're going to take a look at the religions of Christianity and Mormonism, and we'll begin with Mormonism. So point number one. Around the year 1820, Mormons teach that Joseph Smith, who is 14 years old at the time, was wondering which of the many churches he was supposed to join. Joseph decided to follow the counsel in the Bible's book of James, which says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Joseph Smith then claims that it was at this time in a vision at what later became known as the Sacred Grove, the Lord told him that all the religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines and that he was to await further instructions from on high. The Mormon Church teaches that Joseph Smith's first vision stands today as the greatest event in the world's history since the birth, ministry, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. After centuries of darkness, the Lord opened the heavens to reveal his word and restore his church through his chosen prophet, Joseph Smith. Number two, Mormons believe that there are four sacred and authoritative books that are to be taught as scripture, which are the Book of Mormon, Another Testament of Jesus Christ, which claims to be a record of God's dealing with the inhabitants of ancient America from about 2000 BC to 400 AD. Then you have the Doctrine and the Covenant, which is a collection of revelations and inspired declarations given for the establishment and the regulation of the Church of Jesus Christ in the last days. You have the Pearl of Great Price, which is a selection of revelation, translations, and writings of Joseph Smith. And finally, you have the King James Version of the Bible, which Mormon teaching actually says, quote, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. Number three, Mormons, also known as Latter-day Saints or LDS for short, they teach in the Book of Mormon that as the Bible has been transmitted over the centuries, it has, quote, suffered the loss of many plain and precious parts, unquote, and that the most reliable way to measure the accuracy of any biblical passage isn't actually by comparing different ancient manuscripts, but by the comparison with the Book of Mormon and modern day revelations. The King James Version, or King KJV is the LDS Church's official English Bible, though non-Mormons claim that the LDS KJV Bible has been footnoted in a way that interprets the meaning to kind of complement LDS doctrines. Now, this can be a bit tenuous on its face. You see, Mormons will claim that the JST, which is the Joseph Smith translation, actually takes care of particular problematic passages where, quote, plain and precious parts, unquote, were taken out, and the LDS translations of scriptures actually clear up and restore doctrines that came out of a corrupted Bible. Point number four. The Book of Mormon teaches that only fools say the Bible is sufficient and that other scripture is not needed. Quote, thou fool that shall say a Bible, we have got a Bible and we need no more Bible. The Book of Mormon contains many linguistic similarities to the King James Bible, including entire passages duplicated word for word. For example, the Book of Mormon contains 19 chapters of the King James translation of Isaiah in their entirety. Number five, the LDS Church subscribes to the doctrine of continual revelation. As their tenet of faith states, quote, we believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God, unquote. Mormons believe any prophetic revelation is inspired, but not necessarily necessarily infallible and can supersede previous revelation, including that found in their scriptures. The LDS Church teaches that the apostle and or first presidency, the prophet and his two counselors, will declare as a revelation from God and will be accepted by the church's first presidency and the quorum of the 12 apostles and then sustained by the body of the church. So simply put, a select group of Mormon leadership can introduce new church teachings when needed, like publicly banning polygamy, which was a quote, prophetic revelation, unquote, given in 1890, or in 1978, the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 declaring that they had received a revelation that would allow black African descendants to be ordained in the church's lay priesthood, which up until 1978 taught that black African descendants were barred from because of Mormon teaching that had declared that dark skinned people had been judged and cursed by God. Point number six, unlike Christian Trinitarianism, one God eternally existing in three distinct but inseparable persons, Mormons believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are three separate gods. They form a Godhead team. They also believe that the Father and Son each have a body of flesh 
and bones as tangible as man's, but that the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. According to Joseph Smith, when Adam was formed in the image of God, it was a physical image. This means God the Father was once a mortal who lived on an earth that was similar to ours. Traditional Mormonism teaches that he died, was resurrected, glorified, and grew into his deified status. According to Joseph Smith, there is a God above the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is the literal and physical father of all his spirit children, including Jesus and the Holy Ghost, whose divinity is derived from the parent-child relationship. Point number seven. According to Mormonism, everything in the universe, including God, is ultimately governed by eternal, transcendent laws and principles. Doctrines and Covenants, also known as DNC, chapter 93 teaches that man, the elements or matter, and the light of truth that governs matter are all eternal. In LDS teaching, all the Father's children possess the same potential to become gods for other worlds. Like the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost became God for this world or world we currently occupy. They are all of the same human species since like begets like. Point number eight. At a great family council prior to life on earth, God the Father told the spirit children that according to his plan of salvation, they would have to leave their heavenly home, take on those tangible bodies, and be tested with free agency before they could progress to Godhood. Satan rejected this plan and wanted to implement one that would have involved the loss of moral agency. Jesus went along with his father's plan in which Jesus would take on a tangible body of flesh and bone and live a sinless life and atone for sin so that his spirit brothers and sisters could become gods if they freely chose to believe and live the commandments. When Lucifer's plan was not accepted, he is said to have rebelled and taken the third part of the hosts of heaven with him to earth to serve as tempters. However, they were forever denied being able to take tangible bodies of flesh and bones, preventing them from the opportunity to progress to exaltation or godhood. Number nine, Mormons believe in a universal salvation for everyone on earth from death. That is what they refer to when they speak of salvation by grace alone. This is known as the resurrection for all earthly humans. Immediately after this life, the dead will either go to paradise for LDS or spirit prison for non-LDS members. LDS will go to spirit prison and preach the restored gospel to those non-LDS while they all await the resurrection and the judgment. But after the body is reunited with the spirit, humans go to different places. One of the levels is called celestial glory and this is the highest level of the celestial heavenly kingdom, which is for married Mormons who have kept all of the celestial laws and commandments. This is what they referred to by eternal life or exaltation. Now people in these lower groups cannot become gods, but worthy single LDS may go to a lower sphere to serve as angels, not gods. What we have next is the terrestrial glory. And the terrestrial kingdom is for unworthy Mormons and good people who knew about Mormonism on earth, but rejected it until after their death. Number three, the celestial realm is for wicked people who rejected Mormonism even after death. They will experience suffering and pain for their sins, although it is still far superior to anything here on earth. Some LDS may refer to this as a hell of sorts. And then finally, you have ultimate hell, which is outer darkness. This is reserved for Satan and all his followers called the sons of perdition. This includes all those on earth who rebelled after receiving an unmistakable knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Now that we have looked at Mormonism in depth, I wanna point out a cursory glance at where some of these core tenets run into problems with the Bible itself. So for point number one, that Joseph Smith should call the church the Latter-day Saints because of the new vision he received. In addition to all the apparently contradictory accounts coming from Smith himself of his first vision, why would we think that Smith was really told by God the Father and his son that all the other churches were damned and that Smith was to restore, not reform, the church that had been lost for about 1700 years? Additionally, why would we assume, as LDS do, from merely a visionary appearance that God the Father is a separate man from God the Son? I mean, the Holy Spirit appeared in the bodily form of a dove, but no one assumes that he was really a dove. So why would then would we think that this really was the Father and Son rather than angels of light or demons? Point number two, the extra documents and texts that Mormonism brings along with it are troubling. The Book of Mormon is primarily a text about spirituality and Mormon belief applied to the ancient inhabitants of the Americas. It's intended to help Mormons live well. However, it still functions in some ways as an attempt to display God's dealing with the Americas ancient dwellers. And as a result of this, one can expect some historical overlap between what recoverable remains there are in America. For example, the Book of Mormon lists several groups of fictitious animals, plants, and technologies that are not substantiated by the archeological record of the period 3100 BC to 400 AD. Nor does the Smithsonian Institute have any record of these items mentioned in the Book of Mormon in their archives. Lastly, the King James Version Bible was translated out of the Latin Vulgate in some cases, so we're going to run into different sets of translation errors at times. And this can be talked about at length in its own video, but suffice it to say, more accurate translations exist on the basis of earlier and more reliable manuscripts that have been found since the translation of the Bible 
translate into the King James Version. Point number three. The Mormons claim that the Bible has been mistranslated over the centuries, losing precious parts. I actually grow really tired of points like this because the parts that have been lost that are precious always seem to be points of contention for the Mormon church or people looking to critique things. The reality is we have thousands of manuscripts that can reconstruct the New Testament with insane amounts of accuracy. I literally did a whole video on this that you can go back and watch right here if you have any more questions. Point number four. Fools use only a Bible. We actually have natural revelation of God as well as other revelation through individuals today. So the Bible as our only source from God is a straw man argument. Mormonism with all of its scripture goes against the Bible for a variety of reasons and one of the most important being that God isn't inconsistent. If he reveals something later, then it isn't going to contradict what he's already given. Point number five, we've already demonstrated that the Mormon argument for this is actually a straw man. If God gives revelation, then he may use fallible means to get across an infallible point. If it's not infallible, then why think it originates with God rather than man? Jesus said that scripture cannot be broken in John 10 35. So again, if God reveals something later, it's not going to contradict what he said previously, unless he really didn't say it, but some fallible individual was just the one who said it. And if that's the case, then supposedly the latter day revelation is just as suspect. Point number six, Mormons misunderstand the traditional Christian doctrine of the Trinity and typically confuse it with modalism. Modalism teaches that God really turns out to be just one person with different titles or ways of appearing. For example, I'm a son, husband, and father, but I'm still one person. However, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity argues that there are actually three different, distinct, but inseparable persons who eternally make up the only creator of everything there ever was or is. Modalism was a viewpoint that was deemed to be heretical in the late second century, early third century AD. This is old hat by the time even Joseph Smith comes around a couple hundred years ago. Point number seven. I think there's value in bringing up the likeness of God's image in which humanity is created in Genesis 127. However, to be like something isn't to be equivalent to it in terms of its nature. We are in the image of God. We aren't in the nature of God. Mormons teach that we are in the nature of God since we are the same species as him. He's our literal and physical heavenly father after all. He's just exalted and we are in the process of being exalted. That is why LDS often refer to us as gods in embryo. We have the same chance to become gods. This violates several tenets of scripture that teach monotheism, including Deuteronomy 6.4, Isaiah 44.6, Isaiah 43.10, and others. Point number eight, we have to continue to push back against polytheism here. God's nature is one where he is uniquely the creator of literally everything outside himself. Moreover, God the Son and Lucifer are not sons of God in the same sense. They do not share the same nature. The Trinity teaches that God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit share the same nature, nope. not Lucifer. Moreover, God, knowing all there is to know, wouldn't have a counselor. We see this in Isaiah 40, 13 and Romans 11, 34. As such, God never had to have a great counsel to determine what he was gonna do. Point number nine, Paul was an apostle, and as such, he was delivering the word of God. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul equates the third heaven with paradise. The problem here is that the LDS referred to paradise as the temporary place that the LDS go to immediately after death and prior to resurrection and judgment. Moreover, the biblical language here that's used refers to sky, outer space, and the kingdom of God. The language doesn't refer to like three separate degrees of glory after the judgment. The primary passage that the LDS will go to is 1 Corinthians 15, which talks about celestial and terrestrial bodies. Paul compares their differences to the differences of the sun, moon, and the stars. So the LDS infer that Paul is talking about places we may go to after death. However, the context is simply talking about extreme differences between celestial and glorified bodies from earthly bodies. Moreover, from the book of Doctrine of Covenants, 76, 77, and 78, those who inherit terrestrial glory will, quote, receive the presence of the Son, but not the fullness of the Father. Wherefore, they are bodies terrestrial and not bodies celestial, and differ in glory as the moon differs from the Son, unquote. The idea of being united with the Son, but not the fullness of the Father, creates quite a distinction that is unique from the New Testament. Given the example from John 14, 1 through 3, 10 through 12, and 20 through 23, to exist in a heaven type of place where God's glory as the Father is not seems quite difficult for me to fathom. Also, the highest level of heaven is reserved for married Mormons. That seems a bit lame for those who might have been called to celibacy as Paul was. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 7, referring to celibacy as being better than marriage. However, even though both are good, according to Mormonism, singleness cannot be best, which is a direct contradiction to New Testament scripture, whether it's found in the KJV or any other translation of the Bible. So here's the reality. Anything that gets put in the way of knowing Christ as the ultimate is unnecessary. Mormonism adds a plethora of burdens to complicate the gospel of Christ by adding the gospel of Joseph Smith. Scripture teaches, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, Acts 16.31. There was over 1,800 years of church history that predicated itself on the notion that you and I are in equal standing with Jesus when we call upon his name for redemption. However, Mormonism creates secondary and third class citizens, even for other Mormons and followers of Jesus. LDS folks aren't even really forgiven if they end up in lower 
kingdom. And this pales in comparison when we understand Jesus' forgiveness for all of us when he took the sin on the cross and declared, it is finished, right? It's paid in full. The price Jesus paid on the cross allows for you and me to have the space to live a life free of working out of some misplaced desire to become like worthy for salvation. Jesus accomplished all of that on the cross when he paid for it. We live in the freedom of Christ's work. All who accept the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ will be able to enjoy God's presence fully. Anywhere where God's presence is not, is not heaven. So here's my conclusion. When you combine the impressive cherry picking, the lack of historical evidence from non-biased sources, the arguments from silence, and the dubious nature of Joseph Smith, I'm hard pressed to accept Mormonism, but rather label it as a perverted apostate religion that has deceived and at times even harmed some very good and well-meaning people for over 200 years now. As always, continue to do research, keep looking, keep digging, and until next time, we'll see you in the comments.